have a presentation, some pictures. Um, so the, uh, the Taksim barracks were used uh, in a um, multifunctional way. Uh, they were used for uh, for weddings. They were used for political uh, uh, or social gatherings. Uh, the courtyard was used for sports, also for concerts. And so it was a city club indeed. So there was already this function. And uh, the, uh, also the exercise uh, area of the uh, taxi barracks were used for festivities. When there was a circus in Istanbul, it, had, it would put up a tent there, only in the 19th century it would happen like this. Or the first balloon in Istanbul, which went up the sky, started at uh, the Talimhane area, which was not developed uh, uh, until 1928. So indeed, the, the barracks and the Talimhane had that function of being a social uh, place, a uh, public space for Istanbul. So it was like, you know, Dolabahçe down there was the more serious place. And the Taksim Barracks and the Talimhane was indeed just a joint between two kinds of cities because behind it, to the south of it, you would have uh, the uh, Para space. In Para, you would have the, the expats uh, mainly living. And north of Taksim, from Elmada till uh, Shishli, all that uh, the new created district of Shishli was a new town. There, you would have mainly the, um, um, you would have uh, the, the local, let's say, um, elites living in that space. So uh, sports was indeed uh, introduced in that sense. I'm just going to find these pictures for it. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So indeed, uh, it's also interesting that uh, the Taksim barracks here, uh, they are from late 18th century. And around 1860s, so mid 19th century, they got this this fancy facade, this is not the original, this is not the military architecture, you see? They fancied it. So it was made like a city club, so, it is, so this is not a military building. So in the 1860s, they redeveloped it in a way. So they, they refurbished it and so to make it, uh, to accommodate all these social functions. If we just go into this. So this is, uh, so in Talimhane, so there was still some military units there. They would use uh, this, this way, but it, uh, so the Talimhane area was used uh, interchangeably with military and social functions. And uh, here, okay, so, for instance, you would use it as a uh, concert hall here, also for football. And in the very first year of the Republic, for instance, uh, this is a, a, a 29th October uh, festivity. Okay? But with the cross planning, we have now a new clear situation. Uh, so uh, the hilltop doesn't have anymore a, uh, a stadium. The stadium goes down to former Dolobace. And the serious thing, the, being, an, uh, being a, a, a space, uh, let's say this, on the serious, I mean uh, being a place for representation, becomes a taxi square, let's say, uh, means the, the space for representation and the space for sports do exchange area, so uh, the, uh, the football stadium goes down and the representational square comes up to the hill. Okay? And again, uh, so again uh, I will refer to Oran Pamuk, so he, uh, he tells very clearly in his childhood memoirs in his book Istanbul that the Republican elites would always live on top, on the heights. And so the, uh, the Bosporus Valley was uh, a rotten place. The old aristocrats would live there. So this fa the Republican families just uh, would uh, get into their cars and would go to the Bosphorus Valley uh, to visit these old, uh, let's say, the poor aristocrats who could not make it, uh, you know, as new broadcasts to go to Ankara. So they were detached from anything, any new thing. So they are just kind of, uh, they have a very vegetational type of life. They, they need to kind of burn their uh, oil paintings just to heat their palaces and so on. So you have, have a pity on them for these uh, old places. So, so this whole Bosphorus Valley is kind of uh, a valley of death. There's nothing really uh, important that happens there. So the, the new life is all on top. Is in Jihangir, Taksim, Shishli, Machka. So this is the area where the new Republican elite's life is. Okay? So indeed the Bosphorus uh, uh, Valley 
all the villages there do depopulate. So the only thing that you will indeed uh, well put there is it is just uh, attached to your new forum. All other buildings of the forum are indeed also on, on the top. Okay, so all this sports agassari, the uh, theater, later on the library and the uh, music hall, everything is on top. Only the, uh, the uh, open air theater is in just just underneath it. But the only building that you really put down is the sports thing, because there's also space for it, and that's all. And and indeed, with the sports, you do demolish. With the stadium, you do demolish the main square, the former main square. You use it in terms of architecture, in terms of planning. You do use the stadium to physically de demolish the former main square. I have a linguistic question. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Turkish language has a equivalent of the word gentrification, and we always use like urban renewal or urban transformation to kind of define these changes, these brutal changes that are happening in Istanbul and the rest of Turkey. And so, like, people who do speak other English or other Romance languages do know the difference, but the average citizen does not. So do you think that this plays any psychological role in the awareness of people of how brutal and how invasive these changes are? And kind of like understanding, like when you say transformation, it does have a positive connotation. And so when these uh, projects, like in the one in Tarnal Bishop, for example, is advertised as such, do you think it kind of diminishes the public um, backlash or public refusal of these um, of these projects? I mean, uh, of course, there has been, I mean, as there is gentrification uh, taking place, I doubt it. But uh, let's say most scholars do assume there's gentrification. Uh, I would say, except Kuzgunjuk and Jihangir, there is no gentrification mm -hmm. in Istanbul. These are the only spaces uh, where gentrification really took place. In the classical sense, it has happened anywhere else. Of course, there has been also a proposal where Soyulash Turmak we use this. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, but uh, of course, I mean, it is used, and, and, and I mean, the scholar word does use this term, but of course, there are no Soyulu in the Turkish history. Yeah. So we, only, we can only uh, speak of some. Uh, again, I have to use a German word, Azatz uh, aristocracy. So there's no real aristocracy. So there's only a substitute aristocracy in uh, an empire. Yeah. So there's also only, only a substitute gentrification, uh, maybe. Uh, if I look at the gentrification process, I see a non gentrification. Mm -hmm. So in, under all circumstances, there should be a gentrification. We see what happens, I mean, just, I mean, uh, the Bayola area is the area where gentrification sh uh, should be taking place. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in the 80s there was a so-called Esnafekias plan, so the, uh, it means uh, there should be, an uh, express road should be built all around Bayolu. And entire area between Taksim and Galata uh, bridge should be demolished, and it should become the new central business district with high rises. So they have built indeed already three, uh, four high rises. Two of them are still standing: the Marmara Hotel, uh, Marmara Hotel in Pera, and uh, the Otakule uh, uh, office building. Uh, the fourth one, uh, the um, Park Hotel in Gümüşü, has been uh, downsized to 11 stories. Uh, but this whole program <coughs> did not; uh, it was rejected. <coughs> indeed. We must say that Dalan's operations in the 80s is the first time ever there is resistance. <clears throat> so if we, uh, if we do take resistance, not being satisfied with what is happening, a, uh, let's say, an organic part of the term spatial site, so we, cannot, uh, we should not be necessarily using anything that happened before 1980s spatial site. Okay? But this is something I'm still myself dealing with, uh, I'm not sure. Place. But after 1980s, we, with, with Dalan's operations, we also see the birth of urban resistance. Okay? So 1986, the resistance against park hotels uh, uh, building, the resistance against the demolitions in Talabashi are the very first birth or, of urban resistance movements. And today, Istanbul is worldwide by one of the most vital, uh, vital cities with urban resistance movements. So, but then, the project has stopped. Bail is saved. You would expect in any other city worldwide that gentrification would take, take off. Indeed, Dalam uh, was selected in a very dramatic way. So then the, uh, as the new mayor, and the first thing he did is he pedestrianized the uh, Istiklal Street, the former Grand de Pera. He, put, he took the, uh, the tram out of the depot. So, I mean, this nice thing. So this is indeed, this is the, uh, it is indeed the, uh, 
the catcher uh, for any gentrification process. This has all happened in 1991. Today, 25 years after that, what has happened in Bayola? More or less nothing. I mean, on the gentrification, I do understand that the capital that is investing its money in Zekeriak, in Göttürk, wherever, in Dick and so on, so for real estate, I mean, for any small, uh, lousy house which you buy in Zekeriak, you can buy like three houses in Bayola, you can put them in best shape, you can live there. No, it doesn't happen. Nobody lives in Bayola. I mean, what happens is, you, there are substitute gentrifiers. Who are they? The Erasmus students. <laughs> that means the white church do let the because uh, they they do think uh, throughout those years what has happened is uh, the the Greeks left the Armenians left the Jews left they all okay and particularly the expats left in after 1920 so and who filled up their space the Central Anatolians the Black Sea people uh, and so on they filled up the space but now today we are aware that we are living in an old, interesting, worldwide, very precious city, and so on. So it is our most important part of the city. So we do think that the Malatila do not deserve to live there. Okay. So uh, we don't want uh, them to live there, but we don't want to live ourselves there either. We don't go there. We don't invest our money to buy the house. What we do, we, if you buy the space, we just make a, well, uh, Erasmus student's house or backpacker's hotel, if uh, the, uh, the street gets a little more value, we make a boutique hotel out of it, we make cafes, so we make commercial stuff. We start maybe with a fall cafe and so on, things like that, so, but uh, we always use it, uh, say, in a commercial way, but not at, uh, with the residential purpose, it doesn't get the residential function. This has happened in the classical way only in Kuzguncu and Jiang. There, there's not a there's not a third space you can show me in this stuff where uh, citizens with gentry went back to a devolved space and. Uh, no. But in that context, how would you put the title of Russia 360? Yeah, this is not exactly so. Okay. This uh, this is not in the gentrification theories. We uh, speak of the three waves. Mm -hmm. The first wave is when the local uh, say. Uh, uh, the student, the artist, etc., comes because he values this, this old building stock much better and so on. And then after him comes the middle class petite uh, developer, investor, and makes nicer apartments out of it and invests the middle, uh, and invites the middle class which takes the space. But there's the other uh, way where the space is so stigmatized, and this is exactly what has happened with Tyler Bush and with the entire Bayola. So if there's such a strong stigmatization, then uh, since 1990s, a new model of uh, so-called state gentrification happened. A very good example for this is Barcelona. Okay? So where you, because the space is so stigmatized, you can't do the classical gentrification, because no one would go there. So the only way to do gentrification is you have to erase space totally, and you have to get rid of all the people there. The whole, all the brief for uh, the uh, for Talosh project to architects and so on, I know it uh, from the inside, was from the very beginning that would create their gated communities. Mm -hmm. So indeed, the Talosh project uh, does create a new built environment because mm -hmm. they want to get into the city center to keep up with the cars. Mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, but there is no parking space there. So you need to build underground uh, garage uh, spaces. You can't build them with existing building stock. So then you have to. So it is a. So the new law, 5366, mm -hmm. makes it possible that you pull down everything. You just make historic replicas uh, of it, but you can place uh, to the needs of the, today's society. You can just put the garage underneath, and most importantly, you maybe you keep the facades or you rebuild the facades like the older ones, like the historic, historical ones, but you don't use, uh, build any more the plans of the old buildings. Mm -hmm. But you plan, uh, now you build totally different plans because the new middle class you want to get into that would not live in those 19th century buildings. These 19th century buildings are indeed working class buildings. Parlopash was built in the 19th century as a working class area. So uh, there are very small rooms, five to uh, six square meters, very narrow and steep uh, stairs and so on. So a modern middle class family who, who are used to all these new developments to, uh, this, uh, the lifestyle and so on, 
they would not go into such a building even if you put it into top conditions. Maybe intelligentsia would go into it, but uh, the cost of renovation these buildings, renovating these buildings according to its uh, original shape uh, would be so high that most of the academia and artists and so on would not be able to afford it. And those who would be able to afford it would not like to live in these houses. So therefore you have to get rid of the, both uh, the social strata and the building stock, the protected building stock itself. And that's what we call the, the third wave, state led gentrification in all the gentrification theories now. And of course it is very traumatic because you get rid of the entire thing, it is totally erased. And therefore this whole urban transformation process that takes place within uh, the uh, districts of Fatish, Beolo, Kadikoy, Shkulaf, and these areas you have uh, still some, uh, let's say, historical building stock. So this 5366 applies only to those areas. In, nowhere in Turkey else, because in the rest of Turkey there's in no other city uh, the Mithai has left over any, uh, let's say, uh, full areas. You will find single buildings, but not much, except that. Antep or Martin are a few examples, uh, uh, exceptional examples. <coughs> so, uh, therefore, this law applies to these areas. But now, uh, the way they applied this law 5366 has been, I mean, they have applied it already in Sulukule. They have already applied it in Ayvansaray. And, and indeed, uh, the judges have, uh, even under these uh, circumstances of today, have. Uh, Make decisions that there is no public interest of applying the law this way, and there has been also growing, uh, say, uh, rejection, also within the governmental party AKP. So the mayor of uh, Uskudar, for instance, has spoken publicly against the way uh, these uh, transformation projects are being done. So uh, it's to be expected that uh, they are uh, going to do it from now on. They are going to, of course, uh, go on with Tanabashe as they have started. But for instance, Fener Balat and Suleimani, they stopped. In Yellow Mahalis, they stopped. And in many other places, they stopped. I think they will be looking for a new kind of consensus. So, um, because also with it, from within the party. Because finally, they are kind of kicking out their own voters. So uh, that's why I think the luck go on uh, this way. If there will be some more, at least in these areas, I do expect there will be some more sustainable way of transformation. Might be expected. I will not prophesy the conditions. Okay, there are no other questions. Thank you all for attending.